So, Johannes Roberts, welcome to our 80s video shop. <laughs> Thank I you. Appreciate it's you coming a, along. It's a pleasure. It's beautiful here. It, when was the last time you was in something like this? In a video store. I it would it would be I worked in Blockbuster when I was summer from university. So that would have been ninety five. Wow. Uh, and that's probably and then they just started dying, didn't they? I guess. I mean I probably went to a video store after that, but it 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 the whole postal I used to get the postal Oh you went down the Love yeah, Film route. And love all film, that kind of yes, thing. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Which I enjoyed, which was great, which was good. And then and then yeah. And then they all just disappeared. Yeah, and right. I so I miss it a lot, yeah, yeah. Well I hope when you walk through the door some memories yeah. came yeah, yeah, yeah. flooding back Absolutely. and stuff like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um because you're from Cambridge originally, mm-hmm, I believe. Mm-hmm. Where was the local video shop prior to Blockbuster? Because we're similar ages. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they had a massive video store at New Market Road in Cambridge called I think it was called Barney's. And it was it was huge. It was absolutely huge. So that was really my education there. Like that's where I rented all the yeah, John yeah. Carpenter movies for the first time. And we had a small one in our village in the village of Fullbourne where I got, you know, maximum overdrive. And, oh nice. Yeah. <laughs> um and then I remember do you remember Dixon's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember Dixon's used to have like a little just a revolving stand. I think we could probably buy them. I don't think they did rentals, but I remember picking up the like the Children of the Corn one and being like, "Whoa, what?" You're drawn to those Stephen King oh, yeah, ones, aren't you? Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, completely. Yeah, all three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so yeah, there was just something so just like intoxicating about the covers and like, what? One hundred percent. They're going to yeah, kill yeah. the kid. They're going to kill the adults. This is going to be terrifying. And then you'd watch them and. Most of the time, they're just <laughs> terrible. Well, still terrifying as a kid, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't Cujo one of the first horrors you actually saw? Cujo was the probably the first horror I saw. I saw it when I was 13, and it'd been on telly. I was wondering if yeah. it was a video one or no, like a late No, night. no, no. My, my friend Richard Monk had, uh, had recorded it off the telly, and we watched Cujo. I think we did Children of the Corn, and then we did the thing but the first i think the first one like i rented was pet cemetery right i think that was and that that had an impact because it was a rent there was something different about recording off the telly and something going in and renting it yeah and, yeah did so, you know the association between them both being stephen king films and stuff yeah, like yeah i was big i i started to was understand in. this name brand yeah. yeah yeah i think it did become pop culture at the time okay. you know, when i was um at that age, yeah. Was you into stuff like Fangoria and things like that? No, never. No, no uh, not at all. Like the the Freddy thing was big when I was a a kid, but I I wasn't really into that sort of side of it. So yeah, that didn't. I, I didn't didn't read Fangoria. I, you know, I worked with Savini later on in my career stuff, but all the Tom Savini stuff sort of passed me by and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I had friends that were were crazy about it. But um, I get the impression you're more into the classic style horror than going through the Stephen yeah, King I, rather than like the bubblegum almost popcorn. Yeah, horror. I just do something about King and the storytelling yeah. and and all that that really you know, and, and then, you know, sort of discovering his books and all that kind of stuff that really sort of made me obsessed yeah. in that kind of world rather than heads coming off and all that. Mm-hmm. Although I, I do appreciate <laughs> that very much. Uh, Is Cujo a film that's kind of stuck with you? Did that have a big yeah, impact Yeah, yeah. I just, I mean, I just, I was saying, I just watched it again last week and it's probably... I would say it's probably, I, I'm going to say something pretty sort of out there, but I, I wonder if it's one of the best photographed horror movies of all wow, time. Wow, right. It is absolutely stunning. You know, it's, you know, obviously you look at something like Alien, which is like a beautiful, you know, it's like a beautiful painting, but there is something about Jan de Bont's photography in that and, and and Lewis Teague's direction and just the way they've sort of created all this kind of the mixture between the animatronic dog and the dog guy in the suit and yeah. all the different things and the performances and everything. There's something incredible about the movie. It is it has some really very clunky 
middle bits where they try, you know, the narrative stuff. But the the stuff in the car is like still now. I'm just like fucking hell. It's yeah, I, th- like- I think I find that really interesting. That that's a film that had an effect on you, especially mm. someone who went on to be a filmmaker as well. Because that's a film where very few cast, very few locations. Yeah, every movie I've made now is Cujo. Yeah, Forty Seven <laughs> Meters Down is Cujo underwater. Exactly. For yeah, sure, for sure. Yeah, it, it really did have an effect. And I, there's a there's a scene right at the beginning where D Wallace gets out of the car and and uh, the the boy's seatbelt is stuck and she's so she's half in half out of the car and she sort of leans in to to try and fix it and the camera comes up behind her in dog pov and goes up and you know i was watching this at 13 and i i understood pov and i was like fuck the dog's coming there and then the dog comes in the window there and i was just like what the fuck you just trip and that was the moment in my head where i was like I want to be a film. I want to be a horror. I wow. understood that the director had just tricked me. Brilliant. And what I tried to use it in Resident Evil. I do the exact same shot where Donald Logue is, is crouching down trying to fix his uh, gun and we go behind and it's all with the rabid dog and we go behind and then the dog comes in the other side. No one gave a shit, but, uh, <laughs> uh, um, but I thought it was good. But yeah, that's one of the first times i was like oh shit that's a director yeah, yeah. Has, has manipulated me and it beautifully, beautifully have you got a little bank of shots which you've logged so everyone goes references the jaws shot yeah I yeah i do i mean i've tried there's moments um i think my <laughs> my favorite thing that i have borrowed yep. <laughs> is i did a movie called other side of the door and there's there's a sequence. It was a, a, a we did a like a week's worth of sort of pickup reshoots, and there's a sequence where she wakes up, and I think she wakes up next to the little teddy bear, and then she's like, "Hello, hello," and the camera does this sort of moving. It's very deliberate moving around, and she's looking around. She's going, "Hello, hello," and you hear this giggle, 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 and then suddenly. Yeah! against the thing and that it's shot for shot <coughs> it's homaged of yep. of the uh the sequence in the tv woman in black oh fantastic where, yeah, where yeah. The, i've never been so scared in my life ever when the when the the woman in black comes over the top in the i've TV never seen black. the tv show i've right. seen in uh, i've seen it in on stage the stage but, thing yeah. is good without a doubt uh, the most scary thing I've ever seen out of any horror movie. Yeah, it was. I don't know. Now you've seen the stage thing, and you've probably seen the Harry uh, the the what's his name Daniel Radcliffe thing. But the they used to show that on like Christmas Eve on Channel Four. I think it was Channel Four. I I remember I was in one room and my brother was in the other room, and that at that particular moment where the ghost comes out, mm-hmm. and we both. Sh- screamed at the top of our <laughs> fucking lungs and we were not young you know we were like teenagers so i i yes i have politely homaged that uh, i love doing stuff like that it's great fun what is it about um tv horror it seems to be a lot scarier than mo- a lot of movie horror i think for some reason it always gets me especially like the late 70s early 80s kind of yeah stuff. there's it, some it, there's some good there's some great ones when you find them, there's a there's a wonderful movie that um, uh, really inspired a, a movie I did called F, which was called Unman Wittering and Zygo, where someone introduced me to it, and I was like, "What the fuck is this movie?" It's David Hemmings, I think, and he goes to this school and he, he replaces some school teacher, and the kids are all like, you know raucous and and he's like no calm down and they're like no no you're going to follow our rules and he's like why and and they say well uh, otherwise we'll kill you like we did the last teacher and it's just like oh fuck didn't um, didn't inside number nine do a similar storyline to that one oh i don't know yeah that's that's really um, triggered something and Uh, i know they're fans of like really old school horror so it wouldldn't surprise me if that's where they right got it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I think it's a wonderful movie. It's a wonder. It's based off a play. It's um, it's it's a really good movie. But yeah, when you can find like, like a little gem like mm-hmm. that, stuff um, like Sapphire and Steel used to creep me out back in ooh, the day. I don't know that. I don't know that. I yeah, that was a, a British TV series with the. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm trying to think. I'm blanking on who was in it now, but people will be able to tell us. But yeah, mm. that just really spooky imagery in that like early '80s kind of way. Yeah, yeah. I love. Yeah. I love. Like I use a lot in. I and it went 
to say it went over people's heads or mm-hmm. under people's heads or whichever side of their head you want to say it with resident evil like all the kind of 70s zoom lens stuff yeah, like, yeah. like a modern audience was sitting there going the fuck is this it looks like a tv movie and i was like yeah, yeah it looks like a tv <laughs> movie meant to. mission accomplished yeah. <laughs> they just didn't get it at all <laughs> they were like this is bullshit yeah uh, yeah what was your introduction to uh, john carpenter we mentioned stephen king it was it was christine yeah uh, the combination uh, of the two yeah, together, yeah yeah i didn't know who he was and i rented christine because i was reading the books and then mm-hmm. each time i'd finish a book i'd rent the movie and i rented christine it was okay it was fine, and I wondered who this guy was that had his name over mm-hmm. the top because I was used to, you know, seeing Stephen King's name over the top. And uh, the movie was was fine, but it kind of stuck with me. There was something, you know, it was it's not a scary movie, and at the time I wanted, I wanted, you know, I wanted heads. Not, I wasn't like a gore gore hound, but I wanted like some real, yeah, yeah. some more than that, and I wanted some shocks and stuff. So I didn't really. I thought it was like a you know, an adaptation of the book that I'd read. But there was something about it that really stuck with me, the colours, the photography. I th- and it's weird, like at that age, I wasn't into that kind of thing. And then I was very much going through, uh, I was such a king, I'm quite obsessive, I think I must have some right. weird, like, uh, and I was I was getting all the soundtracks, but not, not the um, score soundtracks, they're like, like the rock and roll, I was mm-hmm. discovering music. So I would find the music that was in uh, all, all these movies, um, you know, like the Ramones, Pet Cemetery, yeah, and yeah. all that kind of stuff, uh, and and listen to that. And it's a great way of finding bands. That yeah, me to yeah, so many bands. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's and you discover all this new yeah. music. Uh, and so I bought what I thought was the rock and roll soundtrack to Christine, and I remember it arriving, and then it was like, what the fuck? This is a this is a score album. What the fuck okay. do I want with a score album? And I just became obsessed with this, like, music that I'd never heard before, like this weird, like, electronic music. And then, yeah, there was something, I'd go back to the film, and I think it really, it, there was something about it. There's a real weird pain in that movie, this idea of I'm fucked myself, but I... N- no, and Christine is fucked, but I know I can fix Christine up. <laughs> and there was something, there was something as a teenager, I was like, oh, I kind of got that. Well, it's almost like a teen film as well. Yeah, it is. With a horror film. Yeah, it is. Time. It's a real, it's a love story. And so I, I just sort of, that side really got to me. And then the music, and then what I've used many, many times since then, uh, in, in both Strangers and in um, Resident Evil and probably everything, is the the music, music, music playing, and then stop, and then just this sort of John Carpenter. And there's something really echoey, cold about that when the music just kicks off, and they do that in Christine all the time, you know. Uh, a, a rock and roll track will will play, and then suddenly it'll just turn off, and there's something really haunting there. And so, yeah, the movie, the movie just has has stayed with me. And now, like, I mean, if you watch Strangers, it's, Strangers is just Christine. I just, you know, completely. So when you got that score album, yeah, is that when you put the pieces together? With yeah. Like, oh, that's the name of above the title, but he's also associated so with, with the, the music, music as well. And I, I was very much in. I think I was into music at that point. I was starting to learn guitar, and then, yeah, and then what I. I think what happened is there was also a book on Stephen King that I had got and it sort of talked about John Carpenter as this auteur and stuff. And I was like, what is an auteur? And what's, what's all this? So I kind of became, I'm very, like I say, very obsessive about certain things. So I started like digging into his stuff. And I think Mouth of Madness was the first thing I saw at cinema. Right. Did I see something you had to travel to see Mouth of Madness? It wasn't, uh, Mouth of Madness, no, Mouth of Madness was in, was in Cambridge, but it wasn't even, it wasn't even, uh, on the, on the list right. kind of thing. It was a great, I mean, I could see the audience didn't know what the fuck, you know, they're like, they're like what <laughs> yeah. the fuck is this? Like, so like, when you rented Prince of Darkness, it's like, this is a, one weird <laughs> one film. film. Um, and I think I saw that twice at the cinema and I just, yeah, so I just 
started getting really crazy into his stuff. And then I think it was like at university, you know, everybody wanted to be a film director and I was getting into music and, and I, the best way I could start to control stuff as I'm quite a controlling person was to be in charge of the music. Mm -hmm. And I, I then could, you know, really have an influence on the movie in itself and nobody wanted to take can you know step on my toes there and and so I you know discovered this sort of John Carpenter style of music and would record that for all my student films and then that in my first three movies I recorded the soundtracks too so I did a I did a three terrible I did many terrible movies but uh, yeah a sanitarium uh, Hellbreeder, and which is also known as Alice. There's a couple of different cuts. And Dark Hunters, and I re- recorded the scores to them. I miss, sometimes I think, I, I, I stopped doing it, and I wish that, I might, I might do it again now. I'm going to, you know, I, I do ponder, got a couple of movies uh, in, in the, in the pipeline, and I, I need to find the one that I can, that I feel like I, I can have the control yeah. over that nobody's going to go, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, music's obviously played a big part since then, mm. particularly in Strangers, Pray at Night. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. How easy was it to score licenses for those songs? Because they're big songs which are in that Yeah, film. Pray at Night was a weird one because it wasn't uh, at all meant to be what it was. We shot the movie and it worked pretty well. The, the swimming pool sequence... W- worked off the bat and 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 we it was always in my mind it was always bonnie tyler and that worked that just worked and and then the rest of the movie was fine and i just i couldn't quite find the vibe to it It felt a bit flat and i knew i wanted this christine thing with where you'd see the car and you'd hear the the rock and roll music Mm -hmm. playing and stuff and we had uh country music playing in the car and sort of rock and roll stuff and it just felt a bit like yeah and so it just started playing around with 80s music and then I came across Kids in America which is I must have I must have known that song before surely fantastic um but I just remember putting it on and having just hearing this of the opening and it's like holy shit this is a john carpenter <laughs> like uh track and i i mean like i said i grew i must have grown up with that song i'm surely i've heard it a million times but i never that opening like synth bit and we put that on at the beginning and then so you have this john carpenter like and then it turns into we're the kids and you know like steady up the sunny out and and with the car coming around and then suddenly it was like oh fuck i just went crazy uh, and it just so happened that Kim Wilde's agent was trying to get her back into the, you know, the world. And so was very open to, to uh, you know, doing the licenses. And so she was the first person we got on and her license, you, you pay by side, you pay by the artist and you pay by the writer. Mm-hmm. I think I think it works something like that. Anyhow, so for both sides, for that, like, wow. like, I mean, it was really little, and it set a bar then for everybody else. So we could we just went through, and the only person who went no 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 fuck you was Jim Steinman. Really? <laughs> yeah, oh, no. yeah, right. yeah. He was. So we had to drop. We had to drop uh, Total Eclipse of the Heart. And I, I just, I, and like I say, I get very obsessed with everything. And I had just discovered, I love Jim Steinman and, uh, and, and all his music. And I had just discovered, again, it's a song that I'd never come across before, was Making Love Out of Nothing at All. And I just discovered this song and I'd been just so obsessed with it. And I couldn't get the ending of Strangers right because it just, it didn't feel... It just didn't feel right. And then I, we put Making Love out of nothing at all over the whole ending and turned it into a musical. And I was like, I want, this is what I want. You know, you've got the flaming Christine car and you've got Making Love out of nothing at all. And, I, you know, can imagine how an audience felt about that. 
But again, we had to drop it because Jim Steinman was like, no, 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 I, I know my value, which he did. But in the end, I just persuaded, you know, people, we tried everything over the swimming pool sequence. We tried uh, to pow, we tried Brian Adams. Well, we in the trailer, it's got Tiffany over there. Yeah. You we, use the same thing where it goes under the water. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did, we, they, they, uh, they paid through the nose for Tiffany, yeah. weirdly. They paid, I think, more for that Tiffany song than we paid for the whole of the whole soundtrack but they knew we tried everything uh we even tried the tiffany song on the swimming pool and it, it just didn't, it had to be bonnie tyler mm -hmm. and so once they paid for bonnie tyler i managed to go come on come on now now pay for making love out of nothing at all and they did but we we probably got the whole score for like a hundred grand incredible it, it was not expensive and then to be honest uh, it, it's, I mean, people always talk about the, the 80s music, but Adrian's score on that, I think, is phenomenal. And he did this he did this great score that really brought the movie to life, but it just wasn't quite there. And, and it was like that end bit was like, do you know what? What about something like the fog? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he came back with this thing that he layered up the top that was just the fog. <laughs> and he put it off enough. And I was like, yeah, this, uh, this is fantastic. And he then, like just ticks enough fanboy boxes yeah, for you yeah. as the maker of the film as yeah. well. Oh, I yeah. love it. The thing that people never seem to pick up and they, I, I, is when you have the strangers pray at night thing and the blood, it's Cujo. The, the little blood going down the circle is just Cujo, and but nobody's ever like, oh, you've just taken that off Cujo. It's and not on the director's commentary. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, like that, yeah. Is, uh, is there a commentary on Stranger? I don't know. I'm I don't just wondering. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there is. And then the Stranger's Pray at Night font is just the dead zone. So Brilliant. there's everything. There's like ev <laughs> everything is uh, um, is is from the, is from. Uh, yeah, King there, you know. Fantastic. So what can you share about what you're working on at the moment? Is there something called the Not Polly I saw? Yeah, I think no, the Not Polly will definitely happen in, could well be the next thing I do, which is basically if Stephen King wrote Mean Girls. Uh, and it is very funny, very dark from the perspective of a mean girl. She wakes up dead in a morgue but she's somehow alive and she has to find out who killed her the night before. And then she gets possessed by the person that killed her and has this inner monologue with this. It's, ve it's a very bizarre movie. I, like, I wrote it very inebriated, I'll be honest with you. So it was one of those scripts where I read it back and I was like, oh, I wonder what's happening yeah. now. I had no idea. Where did this come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, that, that's, that I'm really looking forward towards uh, to do that. And then possibly more shark stuff diving back into shark territory no uh, pun intended yeah right. uh, that, that might be there's there's something the red triangle which is a big movie we, we'll have to see on that like quite how that comes together because it is it, it's um it's the poseidon adventure with sharks so it's that that's that's going to cost a lot of money and i'll be honest with you i think 47.3 will will be making its way to to cinemas before too long. Fantastic! Not in three D. Uh, oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> it? That would be amazing. <laughs> Fuck, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, can have that on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's there's a, there's a few things kicking around and, and just sort of trying to. I you know I I spend my life trying to find ways to remake Stephen King things. I, I I'd love to remake Graveyard Shift. I'd love to remake Christine. Well, Christine's the Holy Grail, so you have to be careful, you know. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll see. There's there's a few things. Um. I love that you want to make remake films that you grew up on. Are you familiar with the director, Josh Rubin, who did Scare Me? No. He's, um, that's, Scare Me is a fantastic film. Josh Rubin's like a proper 80s horror kid yeah. as well. And uh, he's on a quest to remake Darkman. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you know what? I, that's come my way a couple of times. And I don't know if there's a script. I think there is a script. I think it wasn't very good. But then I've never been a particularly Raimi. I understand the, the love. And, and I like there are moments of, you know, give me back my hand. Yeah, yeah. It's just one of the best lines in cinema. Uh, uh, but I've never under quite got that sort of full-on jokey mm -hmm. sort of... I remember watching Evil Dead two for the first time and when i was that was a pure video they obviously had a massive like oh my god you've got to watch yeah, yeah. this kind of thing and i didn't get it at all didn't get it at all i was like completely like nonplussed by this movie and i it's only over you knew your path was in a different direction yeah i think that. so yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it took it took watching army of darkness to understand the 
the Raimi world. Um, uh, and, and I had, had then, by then, taken a very different Cujo orientated path. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. I'll put you on the spot to wrap things up. Yeah. Diving back into shark territory. If you had to rank the four Jaws films, which order would you put them in? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, Jaws the Revenge is the best. There's no, no one could, no one, with its two alternate endings, when the, the roaring yes. shark, uh, there's th- that. I mean, you, you kind of just have to go in order, don't you? Yeah. I think, I haven't seen three for a while. I, I possibly, like if I had to sit down now and, and, and you said, okay, Right, let's let's go and watch. I would go. I mean, obviously, one is mm-hmm. is 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 the best, but I'd probably put three there because it's just so bonkers. Yeah. But then there's I a seen, certain charm to yeah, three and uh, yeah, yeah. a and romanticism. I don't know what is it, it is. Is it not written by Nigel Neal? Is it? I'm some, not sure. So I, I think it has some smart like concept guy behind it. I'm, I'm I think sh- everyone's in love with the premise of three. Yeah, three has a good, and I'm sure then if I sit back and watch it, I'd be like, oh, fuck. But I've always <laughs> wanted, and we talk about this all the time with, with, with um, 47.3 and, you know, carrying that franchise on, is the, the tunnel thing had a massive impact on me as a kid. Yeah. And, and the disappointment, the first time I went to, um, like, SeaWorld, and you got to do the tunnel, and it was like, what the, what the fuck is this? What? <laughs> what? This is nothing like Jaws 3. I expected great yeah, minds yeah, yeah, to yeah. be like, and, you know, the sea and everything. Uh, so, I, yeah, the disappointment of the reality of the tunnel. But we talk about doing a tunnel-based uh, shark movie. So I'd probably go one, three. Two is, two is, two I is ca- fine. I, I caught two the other day. Two terrified me in the concept of the helicopter going down because the idea of authority. I always, I've always found that very scary, which is why I think I like Assault and Precinct Thirteen. Is is that authority could be taken down, and here, here was your policeman. Here, here's your savior, and suddenly he gets taken down by a shark, yeah. and that was that scared me. The rest of the movie is is ho hum. It's a bit humdrum. I mean, four is like, what the fuck can you say about four? <laughs> who, who knows? Who knows? Who knows what was going on there? But that shark is bad. That is bad. The end is is yeah. Four is I. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I. You know what I read once in Empire magazine. I see you have a whole load of Empire magazines out there, so it's probably there. There was. They used to have little things of what's in development Mm -hmm. and they they had something john carpenter was going to direct jaws 5 and it was post-apocalyptic uh underwater city uh jaws how anything goes how true that was i don't know and how bad that would have been (laughs) i don't know that was like jason x before (laughs) jason x kind of territory that's brilliant Um, fantastic but yes, yeah, yeah. So there's, yes, that's my, that's my jaw. Awesome. Uh, um, I'm always posting on my Facebook, like, oh, look, 47 meters down. It's in the top 10 shark movies of all time. What I don't then obviously say is there are only about three good <laughs> shark movies. Like, people talk, wow, you're number two. And I'm like, yeah, because. Just roll with, roll with it. Roll with <laughs> it. Roll with it. Because what else? Yeah. Yeah. Johannes, it's been a pleasure, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you too, thank you. <laughs>